The reason they keep gaslighting you, marginalizing you, dismissing you, obfuscating what seems to be the truth and so on and so forth is a very simple reason. And that reason is because we keep drawing random lines in the sand beyond which we can qualify something as sleep disorder breathing and if it falls short, it's not. But there's no actual scientific or clinical evidence to suggest that we should do that. And in fact, the scientific and clinical evidence suggests we should be doing the opposite. That is, we should be a little bit more open-minded with respect to what we consider or label or categorize as sleep disordered breathing. Some important things I want you guys to understand is, for example, and this might shock some people, if you have an HI and an RDI of zero, it doesn't mean you don't have sleep disordered breathing. There are many patients who have AHIs and RDIs below five, sometimes zero, who actually have severe symptoms from their sleep disorder breathing. I myself have an AHI of 4.2 from an in-lab sleep study, PSG, and I couldn't imagine living without CPAP. And not only that, my airway is extremely restricted. It's extremely small. I've gone to some of the best surgeons in the world and they've all said the same thing. They've all converged on the same point. They've looked at my CBCT scans and they've said, yeah, your airway is extremely restricted. Not only is it relatively to the norm, severely restricted, but you're also a big guy. So we would expect your airway actually to be a little bit above average. But not only is it not anywhere near average, it's off the chart small. Yet my AHI is 4.2. Think about that. Another thing we have to keep in mind is, is why is the RDI zero? A problem in this field is that we have inconsistency between labs. Some labs will mark certain events and other labs will not mark those same events. And so depending on which lab you go to or which sleep study you get, you might get a different score. But the raw data between the labs is likely more or less the same. And that's what's important. See, the important question here is asking, when you do have flow limitation or you have resistance, which is objectively observable with some instrument, whether that be the flow rate on Oscar or whether that be a pleth or whether that be whatever, um, like esophageal pressure monitoring, the important thing to ask is, are there physiological responses to the sleep disordered breathing which we're witnessing? Another simple sort of no-brainer endpoint that we should all be aiming for that seems to be ignored is normal breathing. Why wouldn't the endpoint of CPAP therapy or surgery or any of the, uh, these other treatment modalities, why wouldn't the endpoint be normal breathing? For some reason, everyone gravitates towards this obfuscated sort of mysterious, you know, forces that are interplaying with each other that we don't really can't put our finger on for being responsible for sleep disordered breathing all the while ignoring something as simple as asking a question well why wouldn't we just aim for normal breathing right when you're breathing during the day you know stationary let's say not involved in activity or you take people who don't have any resistance and watch their breathing at night you aggregate it all you combine it all and you take an average that would be normal breathing right so why wouldn't that be the end point for people on pap therapy or people post-surgery right like and what i'm saying is like beneath the events beneath ahi right beneath obstructive apnea central apneas hypopneas rheras and other subtle breathing disorder or breathing disorder that's where that belongs so to be clear just because you have an AHI of zero and an RDI of zero, it does not mean that you don't have sleep disordered breathing. See, the focus of this field should be on why patients express this differently rather than this random sort of objective metric that we use to classify the severity. It doesn't make any sense. It's important that I balance that out with saying that we don't want to be closed-minded and ignore all the other alternatives that could be responsible for some of our subjective symptoms. But it also, at the same time, is nonsensical to suggest that the set of symptoms that we are having that is representative of sleep disordered breathing is not from sleep disordered breathing, right? If there's still disordered breathing during sleep, then it's a pretty reasonable stance to take that maybe 
that disordered breathing is still engendering symptoms, right? But for some reason, again, we get to some random arbitrary line in the sand and we say, well, if the disordered breathing doesn't actually pass this line, then, well, we're just gonna ignore it and say, whatever you're going through, it's not because of sleep disordered breathing. But the problem with that position is that there's no scientific or clinical evidence to support it. So just to provide more color to what I'm trying to say here is there are actually ways that we can measure these very subtle disturbances in breathing. But unfortunately, most labs just aren't doing that. And most doctors, I mean, it's not even on their radar. But some of the instruments which can help are your, your pulse profile and from a pulse oximeter. For example, if you're getting tons of spikes that coincide with the disordered breathing, then that's a dead giveaway. The gold standard would be um, esophageal pressure monitoring, which is a catheter that will stick down your throat, basically, and, and directly measure the negative pressure. That's considered the gold standard, but the number of labs that do that is so few. Another, another tool that's used that, that you can look for data that coincides with this flow limitation or sleep disorder breathing is a pleth. And there are some sleep technicians who do use this. And that honestly is sufficient, in my opinion, to get a, a proper diagnosis of, of some of the more subtler breathing disorders, some of the more subtle breathing events which may be taking place while you're sleeping. So something to consider is, for example, for many of you who have uh, PSGs and you have your, your readout of data where it shows spontaneous arousals, an insightful question is asking how many of those spo spontaneous arousals have coinciding physiological responses physiological responses which are indicative of an alarm being set off, an event, in other words. We, we all need to understand that AHI and RDI are not in any way a complete measurement of sleep disorder breathing. And arguably, they're actually a very, they're actually a very poor measurement. And so if you have a set of symptoms, subjective symptoms that are well aligned with the set of symptoms that one expects from sleep disordered breathing, then it's not unreasonable to want to further investigate if you do a sleep study and the AHI comes back at zero or below five or and same with the RDI. And you know, it's my, it's my personal conviction that it's medical malpractice to ignore a patient who would like to do that because you can't say for sure that this patient is not dealing with sleep disordered breathing. But an important point to highlight here is that this isn't conjecture, this isn't my personal opinion. There are, you know, the vanguard of sleep medicine would agree with what I'm saying, by and large. I just wanted to make an announcement that I'm gonna start doing consultations for you guys. I get a lot of inquiries and I just can't get around to everyone and everyone basically says that they're willing to pay. Um, of course, I still recommend that you guys all go to the free resources which are available like on apnea board sleep hq with our good eye might um reddit and so on there's lots of helpful people there who can go through your data with you and will do it for free including myself i'm going to continue to show up over there as much as i can um but i also understand your guys' position if you want to just accelerate through this learning curve or you have specific questions that you think i might be able to answer or if you want one-on-one -on -one time uh, looking at your, your CPAP data with me, those are things that I'm gonna try to, to offer now. Um, so just look for uh, the link in, in the description. Um, and I'm gonna start it off slow. I'm probably not gonna have too much availability, but, but we'll see, because there's other things I, I wanna do. You know, my uh, optimal future is that there is no market for helping people on CPAP because we figured it all out. 